This is The Reason Interview with Nick Gillespie. My guest today is my Reason colleague, Eric Bain, who's hosting a second season of his very, very, very excellent podcast, Why We Can't Have Nice Things. The first season looked at how little understood trade policies and regulations screwed with the pricing and availability of everything from baby formula to women's underwear to frozen chicken. The new season focuses on laws and policies that screw up the supply and costs of healthcare. It debuts on Thursday, September 5th, and the first episode features billionaire Mark Cuban talking about his company Cost Plus Drugs, which sells prescription drugs directly to consumers at super low prices. I talk with Eric about that and the other episodes he has on tap. And subscribe to Why We Can't Have Nice Things wherever you listen to your podcasts. Here is The Reason Interview with Eric Bain. Eric Bain, uh, great to talk to you. Glad to be here, Nick. Thanks for having me on. So the second season of Why We Can't Have Nice Things is all about how little understood or, you know, kind of invisible me- medical regulations make everything worse when it comes to getting health care or even coming up with new ways of treating diseases and things like that, right? Yeah, that's right. So the the first season of this podcast, which hopefully everybody listening to this has already listened to, right? Mm -hmm. The first season was all about trade policy and uh, similar to what you just said, right? Little understood, little known things, uh, tariffs, other regulations that just prevent goods and services from crossing borders and some of the weird economic wonkiness that results from that. And uh, so when uh, my producer Hunt and I went back to the drawing board Mm -hmm. to say, all right, we want to do another season of this. What do we want to do? We want to do something a little different. Um, and I thought, well, you know, uh, kind of the obvious thing here is is healthcare. There's mm-hmm. actually a lot of interesting similarities there. Of like, it's uh, a, a very complicated market that people don't really understand, where consumers are oftentimes uh, not uh, are, are not empowered at all. Really, are, are kind of uh, at the mercy of these uh, larger institutions. And there's mm-hmm. a, a you know a, a kind of political game that goes on of of cronyism mm-hmm. and people trying to uh, gain an advantage not through the market. Marketplace, but through uh, getting subsidies or rebates or limiting competition in some way. Um, and so we started digging into some of these topics yep. and uh, making phone calls, getting people on to talk about it, and uh, ultimately put together what I think is uh, uh, maybe not totally comprehensive, mm-hmm. but I think a really interesting look at a variety of different laws and regulations that, as, as you said, make it difficult for people to access care, make it difficult for doctors to do what they're trained to do, uh, and ultimately like drive up costs for everybody. Yeah. And before we get into I, I want to uh, go through a couple of the specific episodes that are coming up because they're great and you have a phenomenal set of guests and topics. But, you know, what how how have we gotten to this point? Healthcare has always been a problem. You know, we supposedly solved it with Obamacare. Uh, and before that, there were other interventions into the marketplace. So we're going to make everything straight. Um, America generates like all, you know, virtually all of the new treatments and most of the new drugs that come out of the world. And yet, I don't know anybody in America who is happy with, you know, with their health care. Ultimately, or, you know, I, I get I go to the doctor and I get bills from four different agencies <laughs> and I, I don't I don't know what when I'm being scammed or not, um, you know. Can you give a capsule summary of how healthcare, or I don't know, over the past 60 years, how did it get to a place where nobody seems to be happy with it? Uh, some people, there's a huge amount of money involved here, um, but it doesn't seem like anybody is getting exactly what they what they want. Yeah, that's that's kind of the premise that we started with. And actually, in the first episode, uh, Michael Cannon from the Cato Institute is one of our guests in that episode. Uh, uh, he gets second billing because we also have Mark Cuban on in that episode. Mm-hmm. And he's kind of the, you know, the big name there. But Michael Cannon's a really smart guy. And so I asked him this question, uh, basically the same question you just asked here is like, whoa, OK, where how did we get to this point? And uh, his answer is a typical libertarian answer is that it all goes back to the creation of the income tax. (laughs) And uh, I won't I won't explain it all the way back to that point here. uh, But I think the the other problem and the answer that we eventually get around to uh, in that episode is that there's a ton of money in the system, as you said, Mm -hmm. and that whenever you have a market where there's a lot of money in the system, the the market is going to be oriented towards serving the people who control the money. 
And the mm-hmm. problem, uh, as as Canon explains in our, in our first episode, is that it's not consumers who ultimately control the money. Uh, if you uh, have health insurance through your employer, it's your employer who ultimately controls that money, right? It, it never ends up in your pocket and you don't feel empowered to do anything with it. So mm-hmm. uh, even if we could have greater price signals, even if we could have a greater market in healthcare, the kind of ultimate stumbling block there is that consumers are not spending their own money. And if you don't spend your own money, mm-hmm. you don't really care what you don't necessarily care uh, how that money is being spent. So it's uh, we have so much money tied up in, in insurance. We have so much money. I mean, government obviously funds something like 70% yeah. of all healthcare expenditures. And so there's just not the sort of pressure it's, to keep prices down that there are. Hardly the, the problem, like we always say, okay, well, you know, it's because the person getting the care isn't paying directly for the care. And so the doctors or the hospitals or whatever, they pad the count because they know the consume the direct consumer is going to matter. The dark, direct consumer is like, oh well, I'm not really paying for this. Uh, but then, why would the insurers put up with that? Because they're the ones, you know, they're paying more than they would otherwise. Yeah, but it's because there aren't really any strong price signals that exist mm-hmm. anywhere within the system. So you're right; the insurers do have; they're the ones who have the incentive to try to keep prices down. Uh, but there's also just kind of a lack of competition there. There's a mm-hmm. lack of uh, any kind of of normal market uh, economics. And that's that work. partly because the government says, okay, well, these types of insurers, you know, can't compete against each other, or they have to offer certain services in every plan, no matter what. Right, because the there's plan, so many regulations yeah. on what can be included. In a health insurance plan, and because you do have government uh, subsidized insurance or government, you know, basically fully right. government funded insurance that covers so many people, uh, that eliminates a lot of the margins where you would see competition normally existing. We don't get into too much of the insurer uh, issue in mm-hmm. this in this podcast because I thought, kind of keeping in a vein with the first season of being about yeah. uh, you know supply side restrictions and trade policy, I thought you know look, I want to approach this question of what's wrong with with American healthcare and. It, Okay, we we have to talk a little bit about who pays because that's a big part of it. But ultimately, uh, I want to approach people and say, look, I I don't care how you think healthcare should be paid for. Uh, I don't care whether you think government should pay for all of it or whether it should all be paid out of pocket, whatever. Let's find some things that could reduce the cost that we're paying, regardless Mm -hmm. of who it is, whether it's the taxpayers or whether it's your employer or whether it's yourself. Uh, And so that's where we really focus this thing is like, let's talk about places where there are uh, where there are restrictions on supply of care, restrictions on access to care, restrictions on the availability of prescription drugs, for example, and how those things end up driving up costs and harming people. And then, and then, you know, I, I think, I hope that if you were to resolve some of those problems, yeah. uh, then the who pays for it question uh, is a little bit easier to solve, or or maybe it doesn't matter as much. Right. So let's start with uh, your first episode, and there's going to be an excerpt of that uh, towards the end of uh, of this uh, podcast of the Reason interview. Um, you uh, asked the question: Can Mark Cuban make prescription drugs affordable again? And Mark Cuban has started a, a company. You know, he used to be the owner of the Dallas Mavericks. He's in movie theaters. He started out with something called uh, what eventually became known as Broadcast.com. Uh, he is, you know, a billionaire who's very much in the public eye. And now he is pushing a company called Cost Plus Drugs. What is that? And uh, what is he trying to do with that? Cost Plus Drugs is uh, sort of like a wholesaler or like a, uh, a discount marketplace for pharmaceutical drugs. Like uh, if you go to a, uh, you know, you go to an outlet mall, maybe that sort mm-hmm. of thing. You're buying directly from uh, the producers rather than going through the entire uh, the entire supply chain. Yeah. Um, and so he's, yeah, he's pushing this new uh, idea, and he explains it in the in the bit of the episode that we'll play later. So I won't explain the whole thing here, but essentially mm-hmm. he's he's found a way to bring down the cost of prescription drugs. Uh, uh, certain drugs that he's able to buy uh, direct from manufacturers. And the, the big thing that he talks about is just the transparency that this has brought to uh, a, a part of the healthcare market mm-hmm. where there really is no transparency. So I mean, what, yeah, what kind of, uh, you know, what kind of drugs is he selling and um, how, I mean, he's acting kind of as a super pharmacy then, right? So you have a prescription and you can get the drug, the prescription filled at cost plus drugs. Right. You can get the prescription. You can go right there and buy the prescription mm-hmm. rather than going through your own prescription drug benefit in your health care plan or in your uh, or through oh, really? Medicare or something like that. Right. Yeah. So you're paying out of pocket um, and that they've... Right. the idea is that paying out of pocket for prescription X 
is actually cheaper than what you would be paying with a copay and all of that other stuff that's in the background of your your insurance program. Right, because nobody actually pays the actual price for pharmaceutical yeah. drugs, right? You're paying you're paying something that has been negotiated between your insurance company and the pharmacy with a pharmacy mm -hmm. benefit manager in between that's negotiating those two things and then they're also negotiating the price. Uh to try to simplify because it is all quite complicated to yeah, try yeah, to simplify yeah. it in the episode, I sort of analyze uh, uh, analyze it to uh being like uh, you know, a supermarket or a grocery store. The drug, pharmaceutical drugs are a little more complicated, right? But ultimately, it's the same sort of question of a supply chain. Um, we play the sort of amazing, famous clip from Arrested Development about the, you know, well, what could a banana possibly cost, Michael? Ten dollars, right? Uh, and it's and it's like you you know a banana doesn't cost ten dollars, Nick. You, but but what you don't know is you don't know how much a banana farmer gets paid, and you don't know yeah. how many middlemen are involved, and you don't you don't need to know the whole supply right. chain. We as consumers don't need to have perfect knowledge of an of a market. We don't even need perfect transparency. Uh, and one of the things that Mark Cuban is doing with Cost Plus Drugs is they're showing all of their prices all the way through the supply chain. This is something he talks about a lot is how important that is. But as consumers, honestly, you don't even need to know those things. What so you when, need to what's, a, what's a typical drug like, or, you know, or what's an example of a drug that he's selling and it's cheaper for you to just be like, I'm using my own dollars to buy this rather than, you know, I, I to be honest, this is part of the confusion on my uh, prescription plan. <laughs> You know, some drugs are five dollars, some drugs are eight dollars, and some drugs could be a hundred dollars. Yeah. What you know? Do you have? Is there an example of a drug where he shows you that this is? There's, it's like twenty five. There's there's many of them. In fact, yeah, I yeah. Mean, people should just go to cost. I don't want to like overplug yeah. the cost plus drugs thing, but right. it really is quite remarkable. When you go there, you, there's a whole list of uh, of different uh, illnesses, ailments, whatever it might mm -hmm. be that you have a, a farm uh, might have a, a prescription drug to treat, and uh, you click on one of those things, and it brings up the list of drugs that they have available to that uh, available that you may be on. Uh, and for each of them, they have the uh, they have the retail price and then their price and then show you the savings right there. Right. And then it, there's a process to just go right through and buy it. I think what's remarkable about it is that this is the way so much of the modern world works, right, is that you can just go to a website, click on something, see the price, immediately buy it, have it sent to you. Yeah. Uh, and that's 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 the world of 2024 that we all live in. Yeah, that that was expect. the world of like 2004. You know, <laughs> right. I, just, I just booked a hotel room via Trivago, you know, where it listed like five different hotels and what they were offering the exact same room for. Exactly. Like, okay, I'll go with that one. Um, but then you have to get your doctor or, or you have, you have the prescription and then do you show them the prescription or does the doctor have to call it in or? Yeah, they go through a. Uh, I'm drawing a blank on the name of the. It's a, not a pharmacy benefit manager, but it's a pharmacy provider. Uh, an it's a, basically an independent pharmacy. Uh, so yeah, that they they have a contract with uh with a with a pharmacy to actually do the dispensing and the shipping of the drugs. Uh, that's still in place. Um, so, but you're buying through their service rather than buying through your insurance. Is that's essentially the difference? Two questions. One, you know, why is Cuban doing this? He's uh. You know, he's a very public billionaire. He's, a, you know, he's, a, you know, he's on Shark Tank. He's also very active on Twitter and constantly getting into fights with people like Elon Musk and whatnot. Um, you know, why, why is he choosing to do this? Um, and is this something that he could have done as, you know, a scrappy entrepreneur on the way up? That's something I ask him in the episode, and again, I, I'd encourage people to listen to it when it comes out, because um, he explains it in more detail and probably does a better job than I will here. But I asked him point blank, you know, could you have done this as an entrepreneur? Do you have to be a billionaire to start something like this? And he says, uh, absolutely, have to be a billionaire. There's no way in. There's no bottom floor to get in on uh, in the in the drug business. You it just costs too much, mm -hmm. um, and that I think speaks to a big problem. In in not just in the pharmaceutical drug market, but in the healthcare markets in general, uh, it's just become we've we've raised some barriers to entry and limited competition and limited innovation and limited the the people who come in with maybe new brilliant ideas just don't have enough money to get in the door. Uh, compared to other sectors, you know, sectors that Cuban maybe has more experience with, or or the sectors like tech and industry where you see you know new ideas uh, coming along all the time. Uh, and and people who have good re good ideas are rewarded for them uh, in the marketplace. And it seems like as I was investigating more and more of uh, of healthcare for this 
podcast, I just kept coming away with the sense that uh, you know that the innovators, the people who are trying to do something new and different, uh, are are being stymied at every you know at every turn. Uh, and that probably segues nicely right into our the second and third episodes too, which are which are really about that, which are about the ways in which state level health regulations stop people from being able to uh, being able to offer new services. Before we leave uh, uh, Cuban and Cost Plus Drugs. Is he making money on this, or how how does how do they make money? Cost plus drugs is it kind of like a Walmart model where they might only be making one percent return on investment on every sale, but they have a lot of sales, or what? Are they making money, or is this kind of a public service? Yeah, I'm not sure if they're making money uh, yet. I mean, I think his uh, I think I get the sense from him that the goal is ultimately to make money. This is mm-hmm. not a charity that he's running. Yeah. I don't think. Uh, but I, yeah, I mean, it's from what he was from what we talked about in the interview. It sounds to me like it's very much a uh, if we just create this alternative, it'll it'll yeah. be so much obviously better than what you're doing right now than the than the pharmaceutical drug benefits that you're getting through your insurance. That of course you'll come do this. Like he he kept refer and I think there's also an angle here where they're trying to get uh trying to get you know government funded healthcare to to purchase drugs through right. their uh system as well because obviously that's a huge part of the market um so he's talked about the possible savings there've been a number of studies done this isn't just him talking about it either there's been studies done by uh Vanderbilt uh, Vanderbilt University did the, I think, the biggest one that I looked at uh, for the podcast that uh, points out that there's potentially billions of dollars in savings uh, yeah. to be had, uh, as much as $2 billion in savings to be had if the government were to purchase just seven generic cancer treatment drugs at the prices that Cost Plus Drugs sells them for, rather wow. than buying them at the list price that they're currently and, purchasing. I mean, these are generics because you know this is where it gets confusing with prescriptions. You, you, you know, a lot of drugs that are off patent and are, you know, are generic now, you know, it's already they're like, you know, five, ten dollars at, at a CVS or a Walmart pharmacy or things like that. Why wouldn't you know, wh- where is the resistance to people choosing generics or doctors prescribing them or, you know, because it just I seems think- like a no brainer. I think that's and maybe maybe this is the simplest best way to explain what he's doing here is yeah. he's doing exactly the thing you just said that like look if you already have uh if you're you know getting a prescription you may not even know that the generic is available for five dollars at cvs because your doctor is giving you a prescription for this drug and your insurance company is you know you're you're, it's not your money as we talked about before so you're not really incentivized to shop around anyway and it's and maybe it's complicated to figure out what the price is and it's all very confusing and scary uh so what what Cost Plus Drugs is doing is basically just creating a Trivago of uh, of these prescriptions, uh, prescription drugs, generic drugs that are cheaper alternatives to what you maybe are already having. Uh, So it just lowers that uh, lowers the 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 bar or lowers the uh, the cost to kind of switch to something else or to, or the, the the amount of time you would have to invest to find what those savings might be um, and so that's essentially what he's doing is putting all of those uh, alternatives in one basket giving you a place where you can go find them and then uh, and then you know I think that the plan is just to let the market sort itself out. Uh, now there's all sorts of reasons uh, again why we talked about earlier. You know that that people are not using their own money, and if you're not using your own money, you're not necessarily incentivized to shop around. The banana example, just to go back to that, I mean, the average price of a banana is like 49 cents in the United States right now. But if the way you paid for bananas was you bought banana insurance and then you went to the grocery store and you picked one out and you rang it up and you didn't pay anything, but then you got sent a bill a month later and then the, gr- the grocery store was negotiating the price with the supplier and then they were going to bill you, but they were going to give rebates and then you ended up paying a dollar, but the actual price was $10, you'd be getting ripped off, but you wouldn't even know that you were getting ripped off and you wouldn't care about the price and you wouldn't shop around. Uh, so... You, you need to know, you need to at least have some choice in a marketplace to let the price signals work. And that's, that's I think, the goal of what he's trying to do here. I think it's a noble, uh, a noble effort. This is The Reason Interview with Nick Gillespie. Today's episode is sponsored by The Dispatch, your source for unbiased news and commentary informed by conservative principles. Is Donald Trump really going to jail? Does Joe Biden really have what it takes for a second term? Do these questions even matter in the 2024 U.S. election? Get past the bluster and get back to the facts by joining The Dispatch. The Dispatch provides original reporting and commentary on politics, policy, and culture, and it's all informed by conservative principles. Their newsletters and podcasts offer fact-based analysis 
to help members make sense of the biggest domestic and international stories of the day. The Dispatch has created a home for the politically homeless and provides a needed and welcome sense of humor as their writers explain the news. Reason listeners can try an exclusive 30-day free trial membership. Just click the link in the show notes to join the Dispatch today. You've got, um, you know, an episode, uh, it's a two-parter, actually. It's about certificate of needs. This is something you've written about in the past. Um, uh, and you talk to a, a woman named Katie Chubb. She's an entrepreneur who wants to open a new birth clinic in Augusta, Georgia. What is that episode about? And what is the kind of, uh, you know, anti-commercial regulation that's getting in the way? Yeah, I'm, I'm really excited about this two-part episode because, as you've uh, mentioned, this is a, a topic that I'd written about before, something that I care pretty deeply about. And it's also uh, it's a, a more like narrative-driven uh, episode mm -hmm. rather than some of the other stuff we've done on this podcast in the past. So uh, it's interesting. We talked to Katie Chubb in Georgia, Dr. Jay Singleton, uh, who's an eye surgeon in North Carolina, and both of them have spent the last couple of years fighting against their respective state certificate of need laws mm -hmm. uh, The with, with Katie in Georgia. Georgia, uh, she's been trying to open a, a birthing center in uh, Augusta. She had to drive something like two and a half hours to a birthing center in uh, Atlanta when she wanted to have when she had her kids. She has three kids now, yeah. and uh, and you know she's she's somebody who just wants to you know she once wanted for herself uh, yeah. alternatives that weren't available in the marketplace. If you live in Augusta, Georgia, you go into the hospital to have your baby, or maybe you're having your baby at home. There's mm -hmm. not really any sort of third uh, third choice, third alternative there um, and you're in a state where uh, where maternal health care is kind of uh, not in in great shape it's got some of the mm -hmm. lowest uh, ratings in the country in terms of uh, maternal and and uh, infant health care so uh, she wanted she saw this need she felt like there was a, a market for this uh, for this you know alternative way to uh, provide care for mothers and infants and uh, and she just was unable to do it because the local hospitals refused to uh, basically refused to grant her permission refused yeah. to sign off on on the permission that she needed from the state. Yeah, explain what a certificate of need law, I, uh, you know, using your work and other things reason has done over the years, I explain this to people and they're like, wait, what are you talking about? This can't possibly be the system, but what is a certificate of need? Yeah, that's probably where we should have started, actually. A certificate of need law, uh, these exist on the books in something like 26 or 27 states. And uh, basically what they do is they allow state health bureaucrats to decide what care is needed where. Uh, you have to, if you want to offer a new uh, medical service, if you want to open something like a birthing center, in some states, if you want to do something as simple as add hospital beds to an existing hospital, um, if you want to expand a psychiatric treatment facility, if you want to buy a new MRI machine for your health clinic, whatever it might be, uh, you have to first, before you can do that, you have to go apply uh, through the state department of health or through whatever you know the state level health bureaucracy is to get permission to do that. Um, and uh, there's you know various justifications for why these laws exist in the first place. We could talk about those if you want. But uh, effectively, what this usually turns out to be is a, a situation of regulatory capture where you have the existing uh, usually hospitals, but also other large medical providers in the state uh, more or less and sometimes explicitly have veto power over uh, whether the, the bureaucrats will approve new competition. So uh, probably the best case of this, and we talk about this in the episode too, is a story that I wrote for Reason a number of years ago about a, a neonatal intensive care unit in Southwest Virginia. There was a hospital in Salem, Virginia that wanted to open a new neonatal intensive care unit. Uh, they didn't have one on site at the time. They wanted to build one. They were willing to do it. They were willing to spend the money. They were asking permission from the state to do it. And uh, a hospital in Roanoke, Virginia, just down the road, had the only neonatal intensive care unit in all of Southwest Virginia and repeatedly asked the state to block this application. Yeah. And uh, and the state repeatedly blocked it, and and ultimately a, a child, an infant, uh, died at the Salem Hospital that you know whose life may have been saved if they right. had a NICU. Um, and Where so did this, these laws come from? You said they're you know they're in almost half the states or thereabouts, but like yeah. what you know, um, uh, give a quick history because these were originally introduced as cost saving ideas, yeah. right? That they were going to reduce. You know, the uselessness of redundant medical services or hospital beds. 
Yeah, we talk at length about this in one of the episodes, too, with Matt Mitchell at Mercatus, who's done a lot of fantastic work on con laws over the years. And he's a resource that I've leaned on quite a bit for a long time. Um, and uh, he explains that they actually came out of transportation policy, weirdly enough, in the 1930s. Then they were adapted into healthcare policy starting in the 50s and 60s. A few states started to put these on the books. And the idea was, as you said, just to the idea was that state regulators would be able, they would you know, have better knowledge of the market than consumers mm -hmm. and, and the industry would. And so they could pick and choose, well, maybe we need a hospital over here. We don't need three hospitals in this town. Yeah. We need one here and we need two over there and we need another one over there. And so uh, noble, maybe good intentions behind that. Uh, then Congress came along and actually mandated that every state adopt health care, uh, mm -hmm. health uh, certificate of need laws for health care uh, in the I think this was in the late 60s or early mm -hmm. 70s. And then uh, just about a decade later. Congress repealed that mandate because right. there was already a lot of evidence that these laws were not working, that they were actually having the opposite of their intended effects. Uh, but laws tend to be really sticky, and especially when you have special interests that really mm -hmm. like them, and in this case, hospital associations, entrenched healthcare providers, yeah. uh, the the established you know providers in that space really like certificate of need laws because it gives them an easy way to limit competition and to consolidate wow. their markets, um, and of course, markets with little competition end up uh, being more expensive. Um, you have a, a, you know, this is kind of obligatory for a libertarian podcast about healthcare. You have a, an episode that looks um, about uh, kidney, uh, compensating kidney donors. Um, this is a chestnut. Why, why don't kidney donors or other kind of organ donors, why can't they get direct compensation for offering, you know, something that is life-saving to the recipient? Yeah, we actually banned uh, that back in the 1980s when Congress passed uh, the, a law that set up the national organ donation system that we have today. Uh, they said nobody can be compensated for this. And so uh, that's that's a problem. And we talked to Sally Sattel from AEI about this, mm -hmm. somebody who's actually the, uh, a recipient of a recipient. kidneys as well as a medical doctor. Uh, recipient, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, she's she's kind of been on all sides of uh, of this situation, and uh, so she lays out the case for why you should compensate people. We ask, I think, the obvious question, which is like, well, wouldn't this incentivize people to sell their kidneys? And I think that's you know, it's an interesting moral dilemma to discuss. But I think the the fact of the matter is that there are something like 123,000 Americans on waiting lists to receive mm -hmm. new kidneys right now, and uh, we only make something like 17,000 kidney transplants in the U.S. every year. So obviously those two numbers don't line up very well. Lots of people die every year waiting for kidneys. And so if there's ways to increase the number of uh, the number of donated kidneys in the system or the number of people willing to donate uh, a kidney, obviously that's a good that's a you know, that's the right thing to do. And I thought she made a really interesting point to, to me, too, that is if you're compensating somebody for it. Uh, even if it's somebody you know, even if it's somebody who would have donated anyway, that changes that transaction, right? She talked about the guilt that she felt upon receiving a kidney from a friend of hers, from from Virginia Posterell, actually, former yeah. reason editor in chief, and right. that because you can't compensate somebody for it, you feel like you've you've received this thing. There's almost like a burden. Um, Whereas, yeah. like if you could pay them for it, then okay, that's just like every other transaction. Now that's like do. the Godfather. Like, hey, yeah. I'm doing you a favor. <laughs> right, I'm right. not asking for anything in return, <laughs> so, right? But that, yeah, that's. Um, what is the are are there um, are there other countries that have uh, good kidney donation uh, systems? I've read over the years. I have no idea if it's still true. Iran used to have supposedly like the most uh, fully functioning kidney uh, market. Yeah, we talked about that a little bit uh, too. I think she said that that's changed uh, a bit uh, recently. I don't think that's uh, quite uh, the way it, the way it once was, or maybe that, that story is maybe a bit uh, uh, out of proportion. But yeah, I don't think there's any place that allows uh, outright compensation. I think the the other half of that episode too is really fascinating because we talk with Jennifer Erickson from the Federation of American Scientists, and she's somebody who's been out here pounding the pavement in D.C. for a couple of years, talking about an issue that that I had no awareness of at all until uh, until I read something about her uh, about her efforts just a few months ago, um, and uh, where she's talking about the, the number of kidney donations that just don't happen, the number of of kidney donors, organ donors in 
general who uh, who pass away and their organs are are never donated. And the problem there is uh, the the monopoly government contractor that's supposed to be collecting organs from people who have signed up to donate their organs are they're just dropping the ball. They're just not doing their job. Uh, and so that's a that's a, a an absolute tragedy because you've got. You know, as she puts it in the episode, like organ donation polls better than puppies and ice cream. Ninety five percent of Americans have, uh, you know, positive feelings about donating their organs when they're dead. And yet the, the government contractors here are the ones that are failing to get those organs to people that need them. And you so mean like they're not they're not uh, the, the term, I guess, is harvesting, but they're not there when the person dies to get the organs or they get them and then they, you know, kind of take a break or something. And by the time they show up, the organs are no good anymore. Yeah. You hear these stories sometimes about the organs that get lost in transit uh, from, you know, from one place to another, uh, a, a, a basically gets left behind at baggage claim at the airport, that sort mm -hmm. of thing. That happens uh, sometimes. And those are the more high profile cases. And obviously that speaks to the failures of logistics yeah. uh, within this government contractor. Um, but the bigger problem is what you also just said there, which is that people just don't show up at the hospital. So uh, you've died, Nick Gillespie. Uh, yeah. You've agreed to be an uh, organ on donor, a daily basis. but <laughs> you're dead yeah. and your next of kin are all standing around being very sad in the hospital. Uh, and uh, in theory, Someone is supposed to show up from uh, from the whatever the local uh, contractor is and say, hey, Nick had agreed to donate his organs. If you sign this form, we'll take them and we'll you know be able to provide you know life saving benefits to six other people because of this and uh, actually go through the process of collecting the organs. And that a lot of times just doesn't happen. In some, there's there's fifty different regional contractors. They all have regional monopolies, uh, and some of them, uh, uh, several of them, actually collect fewer than half of the. Or no, I'm sorry, only only six of those fifty regional monopolies uh, collected more than half of the organs. That they that they could have collected uh, in the past few years, uh, and very, so this is a, a huge failure. It's a failure. It means that people who are suffering are not getting life saving uh, not organs, and it's also a huge expense because the the U.S. government spends billions of dollars every year on dialysis for Medicare right. patients, and it's and, uh, it and more organs would fix that. It disrespects the donor, uh, and it know, disrespects the, the choice that the donors wishes. made. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, just uh, very quickly, I mean, I'm sure you engage this. Um, you know, is the idea that if you compensated people for kidneys, like, is there any reason to believe that that would, you know, people would be selling, you know, essential organs uh, in order to, you know, get a quick, quick buck or anything like that? Uh, yeah, we talk about that with Sally and uh, her response is kind of twofold. And I, and I think I agree with both parts of it. First is that, uh, well, on, on one hand, like you have to trust people to make that decision. Like this is the ultimate libertarian answer is like, well, if somebody decides to sell their kidney, then oh, okay. Like there's right. nobody else who should really tell you, no, 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 don't do that. Uh, assuming you're an adult and you know of, of right. sound mind and, and you're able to consent to that transaction, that we should be okay with that. But then secondarily, she points out and she explains in more detail in the episode that you know this isn't going to be a spurious decision that someone makes. Uh, it's yeah. and there's going to be like it's with any, like get, it's not getting a tattoo, <laughs> yeah, of course. right? Uh, at the end of a drunken night, it's a night. serious and surgery. Don't do it that much, right? Yeah. You're going to sit down with your doctor and you're going to say, yeah. "Hey, I'd like to donate my kidney. I'd like to you know sell my kidney." And your doctor is going to say, all right, well, let's, you know, let's look at whether that how that'll impact the rest of your life. And like there are going to be levels of control for this. And in fact, if anything, like, again, as libertarians are well aware, anytime you bring something and put it, you know, create an actual marketplace for something, you eliminate whatever black market might exist for organs. Not that I don't yeah. think there's a, a tremendous one there. But, but there, there is a but there certainly market. is one. Yeah, yeah no, sure. Yeah. No. Yeah. And so um, you would eliminate that, too. Let's talk about uh, you have a, an episode that talks about uh, terrible tele telemedicine regulations. <laughs> yeah. This was one of the many success stories of the COVID era that uh, telemedicine, which had been talked about forever, you know, finally really kind of got jump started, uh, both in terms of people doing online therapy uh, and oftentimes talking to therapists across state lines. But uh, or online to begin with, which um, almost all the therapists and people I know who see therapists are like, you know what, I'm good. I would rather talk to my therapist, you know, online rather than losing an hour or more in transit to and from. Uh, but uh, there was also a whole host of other, um, you know, kind of laws that were relaxed during COVID because 
where people were sick was not necessarily where doctors were, and so it was easier to consult. Uh, what's going on with telemedicine regulation uh, now that we're all done with COVID? That that was a huge benefit of COVID. And in a lot of places, that benefit does still exist and has mm -hmm. persisted. Um, I think this is in some ways similar to uh, what we were talking about with cost plus drugs, right, where mm -hmm. this is just the way the modern world works. Zoom is just a part of life today. Yeah. Uh, and yet so much of the healthcare industry seems to be stuck in a, a kind of a backwards mentality. Um, so our, our main guest in that episode is Dr. Shannon McDonald. She's a cancer specialist in Boston, uh, and she has uh, she treats patients, has treated patients who live all over the country, uh, pediatric cancer specialist, I should say. Wow. So she's treated kids, you know, from all over the country. And uh, as anybody who's gone through uh, cancer treatment or knows someone who's gone through cancer treatment successfully can tell you, uh, even once you're cancer free, that's a, an ongoing process, right? There's right. always subsequent checkups. There's always more scans that need to be done. And so uh, one of her patients is, is June Abel, uh, a kid who's uh, he's an eighth grader now. Uh, Hunt and I got to go watch him uh, play soccer. He had, you know, he had terrible cancer when he was a little tiny little baby. And now he's playing on his, uh, you know, junior high soccer team. And that's awesome. Uh, and uh, but he lives in New Jersey because you know, families, people move around and mm -hmm. people aren't always necessarily in the state where they get treated uh, for any disease, especially when you're a, when you're a kid. Uh, and uh, so the, the sort of ongoing follow up treatments that he's supposed to do, the consultations that he's supposed to do uh, with Dr. McDonald, who's in Boston, those are now technically illegal in the state of New Jersey because New Jersey has said that doctors that are not licensed in New Jersey cannot perform telemedicine uh, visits with patients in New Jersey. So, uh, you know, I, I somewhat comically, it's not that funny, but I like to imagine the state of New Jersey, like sending their like health cops after, you know, across state lines on some sort of commando mission to go like raid Dr. McDonald's office in Boston. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, you know, it's, it's really just it's a story about we, we raise these silly barriers. If, you know, it should make no difference where someone is located. Uh, if and these are for consultations where obviously like a physical, like, you know, actual manipulation of the body or something is not necessary. Well, sure, of course. So like or, she's, uh, you know, she does proton therapy for cancer treatments. Mm -hmm. And that's something that you have to, you know, if she's treating a patient, uh, that patient is going to come to Boston for that treatment, right? right? And, and for a, a period of weeks. Um, it's right. It's the initial consultations. Mm -hmm. So she talks to us about how important that is that like, given the rules the way they are today, uh, June may have never gotten to to the, the Abel family may have never gotten their kid yeah. in front of her uh, to be treated in the first place because they may have that connection may never have happened. Right. Uh, and uh, and because pre covid, technically, some of this stuff was you, you weren't supposed to do it. But doctors, there were no, mm -hmm. you know, real, nobody was really checking. Um, and so 12 years ago when June was being treated, that that wasn't an issue. Um, but that that initial connection may not have happened. The next patient that she could maybe potentially treat and save uh, may never yeah. get to her because of this restriction. And then there's also obviously the follow up appointments and checks, you know, uh, right. that that are necessary to do, too. And so. this seems particularly insane in an era where, you know, uh, doctors are pooling their expertise, uh, you yeah. know, when you're looking at things like uh, you know, x-rays or MRI scans and things like that, right? I mean, like, you might not, you might be the doctor and you don't really know deeply enough what to do. So, I mean, this just complicates everything, right? Because then it becomes harder to share with a doctor who's in a different jurisdiction or whatever. Right, exactly. And she talked about how, you know, there, there, there are patients, uh, you know, pediatric oncology, it's a relatively small network of people uh, that do that. And so she will, you know, see, maybe see a patient or see a scan from somebody and know, well, you know, I'm not the right person to treat you, but go talk to, you know, a different doctor in a different city and he'll, you know, he'll be able to take care of you. And, uh, and this is just making some of those conversations harder. I think, I think those conversations are still happening. It's just that they're technically, they're technically illegal. Like, why would we want to criminalize something or why would we want to threaten doctors with the loss of their license? It's not a criminal thing, but why would we want to, you know, threaten doctors with the loss of their license just for doing the thing that they're what the thing they're morally supposed to do, the thing they're ethically yeah. required to do, right, is to treat their patients to first do no harm. But they may have to say, no, I can't take this phone call because what, what I is, don't want to lose you, my license. You, you're a policy guy. And, uh, you know, like, how do you how do you change? I mean, is the the basic way to change this policy, which seems, uh, you know, self-evidently ridiculous, is it to publish? I mean, part of it is to publicize it, right? So that 
you know, the more people know about this in New Jersey, certainly you would think, yeah, you know, like they're like, I'm not going to restrict myself, uh, especially. I mean, this is a state that I know well as you do, but you know, you've got Philadelphia and New York, uh, you know, nearby, which have like yeah. the cities that have just fantastic medical communities. New Jersey has its own, but like, why would it? I mean, it doesn't make any sense if you live in Newark. You're closer to New York City anyway. I mean, it's like you're right. I mean, think about closer. Think about if you put up this barrier instead of in being in the digital world, if it was in the real world. Imagine if he said that you can't call your, you know, you can't call somebody for work in New York yeah. if you happen to be on the other side of the Hudson River. Like you can't. Yeah, yeah. Well, that doesn't make any sense, right? Or you can't commute across state lines to go to work. Uh, I mean, that's effectively doctors, what this like, rule is. Are, who are the doctors' associations in New Jersey or the hospitals? Are they the ones saying, "Yeah, no, we we need to maintain this uh, yeah. for whatever reason," or is it? legislators who are at odds with medical providers. It's again, it's a case of regulatory capture. In this case, yeah. legislative capture. It is the special interest, the doctors and the hospitals yeah. in New Jersey who are licensed in New Oof. Jersey who say, we don't want the competition from out of state doctors who, you know, okay, sure. They're maybe not licensed in New Jersey. Medical licensing is basically the same in every state. There's not like a, you know, a huge variance there. Uh, Dr. McDonald tells us that, you know, her preferred solution would be to have some sort of national licensing situation that would just allow people to cross state lines. That's fine. I would rather just get rid of the restrictions altogether. Yeah, I yeah. think there's a number of ways around this, but I think uh, to your point, really just we're trying to highlight how foolish this is because yeah. it just, particularly in the Northeast, you know, it doesn't make a lot of sense. She's in Boston. There's, what you know, six states within three hours drive of Boston. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it's, it just seems crazy to have rules like this that limit, uh, uh, again, just about, limit people's access to care. Let's talk about one more episode, uh, which is the war on drugs. And by that, you're talking about prescription drugs. And you talk with our reason colleague, CJ Ciaramella, who uh, is uh, an Adderall user, right? Yeah, he, and he he's comes written, out as an Adderall addict. Yeah, <laughs> yeah he, well, you know, let's say user. He seems yeah. to be using it mostly productively, right? Um, but um, what what goes into that? Like, he he's written about how, you know, kind of government restrictions on the the amount of Adderall um, that can be produced in a given year ends up screwing over people who are using this substance responsibly. Um, talk a little bit about that. Yeah, this is our attempt to kind of close the loop and come back around to the question of pharmaceutical drugs, which is where we obviously start with Mark Cuban. Um, and uh, yeah, as you said, we talk with CJ and uh, some other people who have you know difficulty filling prescriptions, basically. And uh, in, in the case of Adderall, this is because of a crackdown by the DEA uh, on uh, they've they're trying to limit supplies of Adderall, trying to limit prescriptions of Adderall because they feel like it's being uh, abused or being trafficked in some way. Um, but he talks about how difficult that that is. And for somebody who suffers from uh, ADHD, it's, you know, for him to go through the kind of the, the it's like he, he describes it as the perfect storm of uh, of regulations, because now there's like additional steps you have to go through mm -hmm. to fill your prescription. And of course, if you're somebody who has who is not currently right. on Adderall, but needs the Adderall prescription to stay focused yeah. enough to like do the paperwork then this is this is exactly the wrong way to uh, to go about it um and we also talk about uh, we're kind of uh, still putting the last bits of that episode together but we're also going to to talk in there about a uh, recent decision from the FDA on MDMA treatment for uh people who are suffering from uh, from PTSD i know that's a lot of acronyms yeah. all in one but right. uh, again it's a similar situation of it's just restricting uh you know it's restricting the ability of people to access the the certain the drug or the substance or whatever it may be that they need uh, to treat their uh, to to treat their you know to just to kind of go about their day uh, successfully and uh, these seem to me so like pretty unreasonable burdens. One of the things that you know ties a lot of these, if not all of them, together is this question of the supply side of stuff. Why why is the supply of kidneys or of prescription drugs or of particular types of uh, drugs like Adderall, why are they being limited, the number of hospital beds? Um, how did we get there? Um, you know, because this, you know, w the one thing that capitalism is good at, and even, you know, the hardest core leftists will admit, is like it's good at producing so much stuff, too much stuff. Um, you know, how do, how do we get people to start seeing a lot of our healthcare problems? Ultimately, it's not about cost, it's about supply. Um, you know, can you talk a little bit about that? 
Yeah, I think that's been the kind of the fundamental problem has been we've focused too much on uh, cost or maybe not even mm -hmm. so much cost, but we focused too much on insurance. This has been the, the mm -hmm. debate for as long as I've been in. Yeah, uh, right. So it's politics, not that right? you, we weren't talking about do people have care? It's do people have insurance? So right. if they need care, they'll be covered. And that's been the fight for, uh, you know, honestly, go all the way back to the creation of Medicare and Medicaid, right? Yeah. I mean, that was the idea was let's get people enrolled in health insurance plans. Uh, Obamacare is obviously yeah. uh, uh, in that same vein. Um, and that, I think, misses the focus here. Uh, not that health insurance isn't important. Uh, everybody should have, you know, some catastrophic uh, insurance at least to cover something that, you know, would be too expensive to pay for out of pocket. But we've we've tr that and that has actually kind of made the problem worse because it's further disconnected people from the actual cost of the care they are receiving. And it's uh, to go back to Mark Cuban's point. It's uh, you know it, the the lack of transparency in the healthcare markets. Uh, insurance has a lot to say about that. The way in which we pay for insurance has a lot to do with that. Um, and so, yeah, there's been a, a real lack of focus from uh, from public policy uh, makers on, on the supply side issues here. And there's been more focus on insurance. And then obviously there's focus on, on the demand side, right? There's focus on like, let's subsidize uh, right. insurance. Let's subsidize drug purchases. Let's make sure we, you know, are always throwing money at these problems. But also then figuring out ways to kind of ration care rather than, you know, I, I mean, one of the things that I like about this series, uh, and in particular this, is it fits in broadly with a kind of abundance agenda question of like, you know, if we if housing is too rare or too scarce and too expensive, it's like, well, build more housing. If medical care is too expensive or too hard to get, why not build a bigger supply? And it was incredibly frustrating during the Obamacare discussions, both on the right and the left. Nobody was saying, you know, why don't we 10x the number of medical providers? And see what that does and figure out how to do that rather than come up with all of this rigmarole and anybody i think who has you know tried to buy a uh a, an insurance plan off of one of the state level obamacare exchanges it's impenetrable mm -hmm. um you know and and an easier fix is just making it you know you nobody is worried about where they're going to get their next hamburger right and and if and if you try something new and it doesn't work out, that's that's okay. Yeah. So much of the restrictions uh, are, you know, particularly when we talk about the certificate of need laws, for example, these restrictions are, you know, well, if something is new or unproven, we're not going to allow it into the marketplace. It's like, well, the way you prove new technology and new yeah. innovations is by letting them out on the marketplace. Josh Windham, who's an attorney at the Institute for Justice, is one of our guests in that episode, and he makes the point right at the end that, you know, imagine if we had a certificate of need law that covered cell phones. And, uh, you know, Steve Jobs brought the iPhone and had to go in front of a bunch of bureaucrats and say, well, no, this is something that people really need. And they would say, well, yeah, I don't know. The phones we have today are fine. And this looks yeah. like this is new and unproven technology. And no, you know, well, wait a minute. No, like consumers decided they needed smartphones like we and and people voted with their dollars to purchase smartphones uh but you may have you know that technology may have never gotten out of the cradle uh if it had to go through a, a similar type process so he says that uh, con laws basically freeze markets in amber and don't let them change and evolve right. and uh, that's i think that's fundamentally the problem you see in american healthcare is that we've f via lots of different layers of government intervention we've uh, prevented the market mechanisms from uh, from working. We've prevented consumers from seeing the prices that they're paying or feeling the, the costs of yeah. what they're uh, getting. And uh, and all of that has kind of worked together to create a, a system that, going back to what you said at the very beginning, nobody nobody seems to enjoy it. Like it's right. We have the most advanced medical system in the world. And yet, if you ask somebody, you know, how was your last trip to the doctor's office? They, they're probably going to look at yeah. you and groan. It could, and it, I mean, it's good, like, you know, in the end we get good care, but it could be so much better. It's insane. It could be better and I, cheaper and faster. Yeah. yeah. When I think about this, uh, the first time that I got, I was on a uh, high deductible, uh, low premium plan. So I was paying out of pocket for X amount. Uh, and a doctor, this was years ago, uh, uh, prescribed me Lipitor, which at the time was still on patent and was the, I think the most widely prescribed drug in the world. And I was like, how much is that going to be? And he was like, I, I have no idea. And I was like, well, could you find out? Cause I'm paying for it. And he was like, yeah, you know, that's actually really interesting. And he had his nurse call the pharmacy and all of that. And he, it came back, it was going to cost like 80 or hundred bucks a month out of pocket. And he was like, oh, that's ridiculous. And then he wrote me a, uh, 
prescription for a generic that was like four dollars and he was like this is basically just as good and he explained to me sometimes you know the brand name drugs are better or they work in a particular way but like i was like holy cow i you know if that kind of transaction goes ripples throughout the system people get a lot more you know they get as good care for a lot less money right and people have to ask that question. People have to yeah. do that work. It's very um, hard to do, you know, yeah, when the people doctor, don't have the incentive they're in to and do they're it. out and, right. and also they're like, why are you talking to me? I'm the doctor. You know, I'm like a, an ancient priest in Peru. Uh, you know, you have yeah. no standing to ask me questions. Uh, um, let me ask as a final question, how did you get into this sort of topic, both about healthcare in particular, but then more broadly this, you know, it's fascinating. You You come back to these questions of how regulatory issues that are often, you know, they seem to be part of the woodwork are actually structuring things in ways that are, you know, not to people's benefit, um, but we, we can't see them. How, how did you, how did you come into this as a topic that you want to discuss? Yeah, I think uh, the probably the biggest single influence in this like way of of the way I think about the world is uh, is the law. I mean, the classic Bastiat uh, mm-hmm. short pamphlet uh, that just sort of lays out basic regulatory capture and theories of uh, of mm-hmm. economics about you know the way in which politics and, and economics uh, interact. Uh, public choice. Uh, basically, it's proto public choice theory is what you could probably call that. Um, right. Anybody who hasn't read that, I'd strongly recommend it. It's I think it's a pretty basic uh, libertarian uh, piece of of writing. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, you, I mean, I remember reading f- that for the first time. Where did you first come across that? Do you remember? I ca- I remember reading it on a bus uh, through Normandy when I was studying Normandy, France. in college in Normandy, France. Okay. I don't remember why I had it with me or why, yeah. uh, but I remember that's where I was reading it uh, on this long <laughs> bus trip that we took from from Belgium down to Normandy. Uh, it wasn't, you know, it wasn't like assigned a in class or anything. Um, I think I may have I may have picked it up through, uh, and I, I think I, I was going to an IHS seminar that summer, okay. so it may have so been like the an Institute for, for Humane that. Studies. But they might have given it to you. How did I you get so, interested yeah. in in kind of uh, both libertarian ideas and then journalism? Uh, well, I think there's actually a lot of overlap between those things, right? I find a lot of uh, I, I I wish there was more overlap, I should say, but I mean I think there's a a skepticism and maybe even a cynicism that comes from uh, from from libertarianism about the ways in which the state works and the ways in which uh, political leaders you know think and operate, and uh, and then I think that uh, is reflected certainly in reasons journalism and in my own journalism, and I wish it was reflected more broadly, but I think it should be reflected in uh, in journalism more broadly. Uh, my uh, you know my earliest connection to libertarianism was probably I mean I credit my father with some of this because he was a libertarian volunteer volunteered with the Montgomery County Libertarian Party when I was a kid. Um, but then recently I was thinking, you know, uh, he he was a, a big fan of Bob Marley's music when I was a kid. Uh-huh. Um, and it's not like I was not one of those high schoolers who had dreadlocks or anything like that. But from the time I was about seven years old, I, I knew like the, the Legend album at least and a bunch of other Bob Marley stuff. And there's uh, I Shot the Sheriff. You know, have you ever thought about that song? That is that is basically maybe my libertarian origin theory is that, uh, you know, okay, it's so it's not about doing violence against the police, which is what you may think if you've never looked at the lyrics closely. Uh, What that song is actually about is about a guy who's being like repeatedly harassed unnecessarily by the sheriff in this town. And then he eventually says, I'm going to leave. He gets up to try to leave town and the sheriff comes after him with a gun. And then he and then that's the the defense. The chorus of the song is that, yes, I shot the sheriff. I acted in self-defense. But I didn't shoot the deputy. Like, note, note, this was not violence against the police in general. I'm yeah. not advocating for, you know, it's not right. anarchy here. It is uh, self-defense that, like, this one guy was uh, was trying to ruin my life. And so I acted uh, accordingly. Um, so it's possible that that song was that's somehow uh, part of my libertarian origin story, strangely enough. I, uh, you know, that's a, a wonderful note to uh, end <laughs> this conversation on, uh, and particularly the Marley version which is you know obviously better than the uh yeah, Eric Clapton version obviously, which to yes. Clapton's credit uh you know brought Marley to a, a bigger and bigger audience sure. so it all works out Eric Bain thanks for talking hey thanks for having me